Good afternoon and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm Robert Litvak, Senior Vice President of the Wilson Center. It is my great pleasure on behalf of our President and CEO, Jane Harmon, uh, to welcome you to the fourth annual Swiss Day. A particularly warm welcome to Ambassador Martin de Hinden. Uh, we collaborate closely with the Swiss Embassy on a number of issues here at the Center, and we're grateful for the Embassy's support, uh, Mr. Ambassador. It, it's really an honor to have you here. I'm also delighted to welcome back uh, Professor uh, Andreas uh, Kellerhall in the front row, Director of the Europe Institute at the University of Zurich. He's a Wilson Center Global Fellow and co-host, his institution's co-host of today's event. Uh, without the partnership and support of our good friends at the Europe Institute, uh, Swiss Day would not be possible. The Wilson Center, uh, chartered by Congress in 1968 as the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, is the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue uh, to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. Next year, the Center will celebrate its 50th anniversary. Uh, we at the Wilson Center are delighted once again to co-host this year's annual Swiss Day, which seeks to highlight Swiss perspectives and enhance our dialogue on transatlantic issues. Today's event will focus on U.S. cross-border investments. We have a panel of distinguished experts to address the issue, chaired by our eminent public policy fellow, Kent Hughes, who was right there. Okay, <laughs> I thought you were here. Um, special focus will be given to Switzerland, which is the sixth biggest investor in the United States. Swiss Day is only one part of our partnership. Each year, the center welcomes, among its 120 fellows, two competitive, competitively selected Swiss scholars to work here in Washington, D.C. We currently have in, in residence Professor Andreas Gross, who's working on a comparative study, direct democracy in Switzerland and the United States since the turn of the century. Thanks in part to this program, we now have a sizable group of Swiss alumni underpinning the center's deep and productive relationship with Switzerland. And I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Maria Stella Gatzoulis, uh, who has been the coordinator at this end of arranging Swiss Day. Thank, thanks to her for making this possible. And thank all of you for joining us here at the Wilson Center. And with that, let me turn uh, over the floor over to Professor Keller Halls for his opening remarks. Thank you. Dear Mr. Vice President, Mr. Ambassador, distinguished guests, dear friends of Switzerland, I, I might say, this is, as it was said, the fourth time that um, the Europa Institute at the University of Zurich in cooperation with the Woodrow Wilson Center with the support of the Swiss Embassy, can organize such a Swiss day here in Washington, D.C. Originally, the idea was to put Switzerland, which is not that big, as you know, at least once a year here in Washington, somewhere a little bit on the focus, so that we, we, we speak about Switzerland and what we do, uh, and, and about, you know, issues of, 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 of cross-border interest. And um, so we have done this successfully three times, and today um, I'm very happy to see so many here uh, attending this conference that I think also the fourth event will be a uh, success. As it was mentioned, this is just one part of our cooperation. The other part is the scholarship program where we can every year send two scholars here from Switzerland for uh, three or four months to, uh, to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, and they study and they get a wonderful uh, treat. Um, and everybody who comes home is delighted and is part of this international network that the Woodrow Wilson Center so wonderfully um, provides. A special thank here again to Woodrow Wilson Center and the Swiss Embassy. We are, a, I think, a great network. We work perfectly together and it's really a delightful uh, uh, a thing that we can do that once, once a year. So we are looking forward to many more years to come and many more conferences to come. Thank you very much for all being here.
It's now it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Ambassador De Hendren. Am I saying that correctly, Mr. Ambassador? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are delighted to have the ambassador here, and he brings an enormous array of global experience with him. He's, as a career official with the Swiss government, he's really done everything from human rights to uh, nuclear proliferation and has a hand, of course, not surprisingly, in the global economy. He was at one point the, uh, a s part of the Swiss team at the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. So the ambassador will give us uh, his overview of the question that we're looking at today, cross-border investment. So Mr. Ambassador, please, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President, Professor Kellerhals, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to speak at the topic of Swiss-American trade relations. Switzerland and the United States have long-standing uh, relations. They go far back in a time when our countries have been the only republics uh, on, on the globe. Uh, still now, there are, is a lot of different areas where there is a close cooperation. The most prominent, perhaps, is uh, the role we are playing to represent uh, uh, the United States in Iran. There is a lot of science uh, cooperation in many areas, but perhaps the most un outstanding and also the least known to some extent are the economic ties in between the United States and uh, Switzerland. The, um, I will come up with a whole series of statistics and statements. You will find those data in a publication we have released earlier this year released on the ba mainly on the basis of data of information from U.S. statistics and then we did complement it uh, to come up with, uh, with more precise and Switzerland-related issues. Switzerland has about the size of, uh, 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 of 1% of the U.S. Uh, territory. And Switzerland, in the same time, is number six investor in the United States with a cumulative volume of uh, $217 billion in 2016, the latest figures uh, we have. Swiss investments in the United States rivals that of other foreign investors which much larger economy and populations like Germany or France. In fact, Switzerland uh, at the United States is the largest recipient of outbound Swiss investment. More than 500 Swiss companies with about 3,500 business locations create almost half a million jobs all over the country. These are direct jobs, not including those who are working in the distribution networks or the jobs that are indirectly created by this. This would be a much larger number. Uh, Swiss firms sustain American jobs in every state. Swiss affiliate employment is highest in California, Texas, New York, New Jersey, and Illinois. But even the nation's smaller states benefit from Swiss investments. New jobs were added in 38 states between, uh, during the last 10 years, with the largest percentage gains in New Mexico, North Dakota, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. The diversified landscape here includes large multinational Swiss firms with well-known names as ABB, and we'll have, a, uh, we'll have uh, ABB represented here on the table, 
Credit Suisse, Nestle, Novartis, UBS, Zurich, and many other companies. But something that is important to know, there are a lot of small and medium-sized enterprise. This reflects very much the Swiss economy itself, where smaller and medium-sized uh, uh, companies play an important role. Many of the products you of those companies you would not know, they are very often very specialized and are linked in a broader, uh, in a broader chain of, uh, of manufacturing of uh, production. Swiss investments also boosts, or in particular boosts, American manufacturing employment. It's about 190,000 manufacturing jobs, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, means that this is much more than many other, uh, many other investors uh, uh, together. To bolster their U.S. investments in 2013, the latest year of available data from the U.S. government, Swiss companies spent more than 10 billion on research and development activities in the United States. And this gives uh, Switzerland the top ranking among all foreign investing countries and shows also or say something about the quality uh, of the investment. This supports 24,000 research-related jobs in the United States, and it also uh, is demonstrates the commitment uh, of the Swiss economy to high-tech work and innovation in the United States. Swiss companies, and this is another point, and affiliates pay an average annual salary of more than $100,000. This is $42,000 more than the nation's average salary in the private sector. Uh, how else does the United States benefit from Swiss investment? Like all companies in the United States, foreign affiliates pay U.S. income taxes at 4.3 billion. Swiss companies, Swiss firms rank fourth in this metric, paying more taxes, for instance, than Canadian firms. After this, um, let's say uh, th those words about investment, let me come up with a couple of remarks regarding trade. Besides Swiss companies' commitment to the United States through investment, uh, I have to underline that Switzerland and the United States are important trading partners. The bilateral trade in goods and services exceeds $100 billion. In 2016, 14% of total Swiss exports in goods went to the United States. This is the third after Germany, uh, after Germany and Italy. In the last 20 years, Swiss exports to the United States have more than tripled, very much like the investments. U.S. goods exports to Switzerland exceed 22 billion, putting us ahead as a customer, to put it like this, of countries like India or Saudi Arabia in terms of U.S. export markets. American firms ship a variety of goods to Switzerland, ranging from primary metals and chemicals to electronics and transportation equipment. The U.S. export more products to Switzerland than to Scandinavia, the Baltic States, and Austria combined. But even more significant is the export of U.S. services to Switzerland, which totals nearly 30 billion, making Switzerland the seventh largest market for services. We consume more American services than either Brazil or Germany. 
exports of these services from the United States to Switzerland support more than 185,000 American jobs. Last but not least, let me emphasize that uh, the embassy is following closely those uh, developments, is giving advice to people from uh, the private sector. And whenever you have questions, do not hesitate to contact us. If you are not in a position to give you the answer you're interested in, we will make sure that you get to the right people to eventually have the information you need. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That's a very impressive story. We, of course, will encourage you to continue to invest and move up to number five position, <laughs> if that's possible. We'll do our best. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'd like to uh, call on Anne McKinney to join us. She's agreed to really set the stage for the discussion that the panel will have. Anne brings a wealth of experience to the question of foreign investment. She's now at the U.S. Department of Commerce, where she's the Director of Investment Services for Select USA. This is the American program that encourages countries from around the world to choose America as their spot to make a foreign investment. She has a background at the Trade and Development Agency, which again is a global perspective on things. She was there, I think, for a dozen years. She has advised private sector companies, and she has served as the Deputy Director of the Colombian U.S. Chamber of Commerce, so it's a wealth of experience. And let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking the Wilson Center and the Europa Institute at the University of Zurich for the opportunity to join you today. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to Ambassador de Hinden and his team at the Swiss Embassy for their strong partnership with Select USA. Given the strong position of Swiss investment in the United States, and the economic ties between our two countries. It is a great pleasure to represent the Department of Commerce and Select USA at this fourth annual Swiss Day at the Wilson Center with the emphasis on FDI. I appreciate the opportunity to provide introductory remarks and help set the stage for the presentations that will follow. The United States is the leading destination for global foreign direct investment with a stock valued at more than $3.7 trillion in 2006. There are many factors that motivate companies to select the United States as part of their international growth strategy. Success in the U.S. market can help drive success globally. Companies of all sizes, from startups to multinationals, are able to take advantage of all that the U.S. market has to offer, including the world's most attractive consumer market, the proximity to their customers, strong capital markets, a stable business environment, one of the most productive workforces in the world, a culture of innovation backed by strong intellectual property rights protections. Promoting high impact investment in the United States is a key pillar of our work at the U.S. Department of Commerce and the central mission of the Select USA program at the International Trade Administration. Select USA, together with our commercial service colleagues across the United States and around the globe, work closely with U.S. economic development organizations at the state, local, and regional level to help support their efforts to attract foreign direct investment to their communities. And we serve as an initial stop for international firms as they're navigating and beginning to enter the U.S. market. We support companies of all sizes at all stages of the investment process, from companies exploring the market for the first time to already existing investors that are looking to expand their operations here. We help companies move their investments forward by providing information to support business decisions, helping companies identify and connect with the right contacts at the local and state level, and also helping companies address issues that involve federal regulations, pulling on an, and drawing on a network of more than 20 federal government agencies that touch business investment. The Select USA Investment Summit is a prime example of how we connect international companies with state, local, and regional economic development organizations. Later this month, we'll be launching registration for the 2018 Select USA Investment Summit, which is scheduled to take place June 20th through the 22nd 
in the Washington area at nearby National Harbor, Maryland. We also organize events throughout the year um, to bring together investors and economic development organizations, and we're looking forward to an active program in Switzerland. Before closing, I'd like to share the experience of one Swiss company that has worked with Select USA and that I believe illustrates many of the reasons why companies choose the United States as their investment destination, but also illustrate the many benefits that foreign direct investment brings to the U.S. economy and our communities. Orlikin is a Swiss manufacturer with a global footprint in 37 countries and sales of more than $2.3 billion. They were looking for a location to start new manufacturing operations to solidify their position in the additive manufacturing industry. Following their initial contact at the U.S. Embassy in Bern and with Select USA staff in Switzerland, the company participated in the 2016 Select USA Investment Summit, where they joined a robust delegation of Swiss firms. Their company officials were able to connect with a wide range of service providers and economic development officials, including the Charlotte Regional Partnership, who then worked with the company hand in hand as they planned their investment. They've recently announced their plans to open a new manufacturing facility in Huntsville, North Carolina, where they will serve their U.S. industrial customers with a single source and a full suite of integrated advanced manufacturing services, including research and development, design, applications engineering, production and processing. This facility will also employ engineers, research and development technicians, and skilled craftsmen at an average salary well above the regional average, and as the ambassador noted, well above um, the national average as well. When Swiss companies like Orlikan, among many others, including ABB and the many companies, Swiss and other international companies that are members of the International, of the Organization for International Investment, when they decide to grow their business by investing in the United States, our communities and our economy benefit, and the result is a win-win both for Switzerland and the United States. We look forward to continuing to connect more Swiss companies with communities across the United States to help generate jobs, promote innovation, and drive U.S. exports. It's a wonderful opportunity to highlight examples of this shared success and the productive relationship that exists between the companies and our, our two governments. So thank you again for the invitation to be here today. Um, and so I turn the floor back to you. <laughs> thank you, Anne, very much. You really have set the stage and given us a sense of the stake that's involved in attracting foreign direct investment, how much you can contribute to any economy, but certainly here to the U.S. economy. Well, you heard twice, Anne referred to it, the ambassador did, ABB, which is an enormous company, and we are very fortunate today to have a representative of ABB, Jim Creevy. He's the uh, VP for Government Relations, which of course is an enormous Swiss company that does operate really around the world. He uh, earlier uh, misspent part of his youth, as I did, working on Capitol Hill. I've actually, it's a wonderful experience, and for young people, I absolutely take advantage of it. And he also was then four years, I believe, with the National Electrical Manufacturers Association. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, like everyone else, thank you to the Wilson Center uh, for inviting ABB to be here. Uh, thanks to the Europa Institute and thanks to the Swiss Embassy, of course. I think I should have some slides dialed up here. Um, but for those of you who don't know ABB, um, and, and we'll get into that, but uh, we are a global uh, industrial technology provider. We are based out of Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, we have 125,000 employees globally, including 20,000 in the U.S. Um, our markets are the utility sector, um, <coughs> industry, and transportation and infrastructure. Um, we're incredibly optimistic about the United States and our investments here. Um, our recent history will, will show you that we have uh, invested an incredible amount of money in the U.S. Um, in the past 10 years. You'll see a slide in a moment here that talks about uh, some of those investments. 
But we've done so, um, and it's really dramatically changed our footprint in the United States. So since 2007, uh, we've more than tripled our workforce here. Um, and now we are in, uh, we have over 50 manufacturing facilities um, in the U.S. Um, headquarters moved down to Cary, North Carolina. Uh, we've grown our customer base uh, by a huge margin. Um, as I said, 53 manufacturers now. Um, and as the ambassador was speaking of, we've really um, expanded our R&D. And the U.S. is now a hub for our global research and development. Uh, so let me give you some examples of these investments that we have made. Um, and they've been acquisitions. They've been um, greenfield development. They've also been expansions of existing facilities. Um, and we've done these for various business reasons, but uh, the ultimate reason is for our customers. Um, so I'll give you some examples here. Um, in 2015, we expanded our robotics facility in Auburn Hills, Michigan. Uh, so we are, are really the first industrial robotics uh, company to truly commit to a U.S. manufacturing presence. Um, and we did that to give shorter lead times to our customers um, and to enhance our collaboration with them. We acquired a company called Thomas & Betts uh, in 2012 um, out of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, one of the reasons for doing that was uh, to get greater access to their dis distributor channels uh, so we can get to our customers uh, in a new, a new way here in the U.S. Um, and then recently we have announced uh, plans to acquire a portion of GE called GE Industrial um, Service uh, System system Solutions, GE Just Industrial Solutions. So this fills out um, a gap in, in our low voltage uh, product line. So lots of reasons for investing, but it really comes down to our customers. Uh, but we have customers around the world, um, and we have limited investment dollars as a, as a corporation. So why is it that we invest here in the U.S.? Well, the number one reason, I'll give you three. Number one reason is the market. Uh, it's an immense market, um, and it's really undergoing huge transformation uh, that in our markets. Um, we're talking about energy, the, industrial, the energy revolution that's taking place in terms of renewables and grid investments. Um, we're also talking about the industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. You had mechanization, electrification, software, and now truly digitalization. So um, manufacturers and industry are really transforming their operations, so we want to be here to take advantage of, of, of that market opportunity. You could put a third up here called um, infrastructure. Uh, as you know, this country has a huge infrastructure um, investment deficit, and, and we're looking to correct that over these coming years, so we want to be here in the U.S. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is digitalization. Um, ABB recently established our digital center of excellence in Silicon Valley, and we've actually put our chief digital officer there in, in uh, San Jose. Um, our future is really tied to digital, and, uh, and nowhere is digitization, digitalization happening faster um, than the U.S. It's really the center, so we need to be here. Um, this is not a new arena for us. We actually are, are really a digital company. Um, for the past 40 years, we've been offering um, a variety of software and digital uh, solutions to our customers, uh, industrial control systems and the like. Um, and actually out there in the field, we have 70,000 industrial control systems. We've got 70 million different um, devices with sensors and communications that are, that are feeding information back. Um, and some 55% of our revenues are tied to uh, digital solutions. Um, and it's, the U.S. has the ecosystem that we need. Um, it's not just ABB and our customers. We're partnering with Microsoft. We're partnering with IBM. We're investing in startups um, in Silicon Valley. We have uh, an organization called ABB Technology Ventures where we invest in, in uh, cutting-edge startups in the digital world. Uh, so we have some investments in companies called Vicarious, which is in artificial intelligence, and Trilliant, which is in uh, utility networking, and, and many others. Um, and as the ambassador spoke of, research. Uh, we do a lot of research here in the U.S., and a lot of that is connected to the digital side of things. Um, so the future is going to be written by, by how well companies take advantage of digital, and the U.S. is where it's happening. And finally, uh, workforce. You know, you could have all the customers, you could have all of these technologies, but if you don't have the workforce, you can't take advantage of it in this country. You could serve the market from elsewhere, but we're able to serve the market from the U.S. because of the U.S. workforce. Um, great universities, great talent, a pro-business environment, as was said earlier. Um, so we are able to make things here, and we've really doubled down on our investment on, on the worker in, in the United States. Um, and we invest in our worker. Um, it's, we don't just hire them. We, we train them. We bring them along uh, through um, all manner of, of uh, technical training and the like. 
So that's what brings us here, those three things. Um, but what keeps us here is that we're really tied to our communities. Um, you know, we, ha we have these local connections. Uh, these, ma many of, the, of the, the businesses we, we now own have deep roots in the United States. Um, brands like Westinghouse. We bought a portion of Westinghouse in the, in the 1980s. Bailey Controls, Baldor Electric, Thomas & Betts. Um, these are really all American companies, and, and we've invested in them to, to keep them all American companies and serve our American customers. Um, and in the U.S., we're very American. We are a Swiss company, absolutely. Um, but in the U.S., we look very American. Same in Switzerland, we look very Swiss. In Sweden, we're very Swedish. In China, we're very Chinese. Um, and we think that's a strength. We're, we're, we localize to serve our local customers, um, and, and we think that's the best way to do business. So we're optimistic about the U.S., um, but there are, there are some challenges, um, and perhaps we don't do a good enough job um, as, as a company, as an industry, um, telling the story of foreign direct investment. Um, we, we look very American, as I said. Sometimes people don't know that we're Swiss, um, and, and so we, we need to do a better job of connecting our employees' paychecks to the fact that, that this is um, a Swiss company that has invested here in the U.S. and invested in them um, and their communities. Um, and so this, this void has, has arisen, um, and so I think that that is part of the reason why um, economic nationalism has really become um, a real hot topic these days. Um, I don't know that the American public fully appreciates the, uh, the amount of foreign direct investment um, in our communities that's truly benefiting uh, the United States and its citizens. So it's something we need to do uh, a better job of, and you know, we're seeing some things in the policy world, and I'm sure Nancy will touch on a few of those things. Uh, with regard to tax and trade and other matters um, that could really be served by a, a better understanding um, and a better job of communicating by companies like ABB about the benefits of foreign direct investment. Um, so we're committed to the U.S. We've got the markets, we've got the technology, and we've got the workforce. So we're very optimistic and hope that our, our next decade is as good as our last. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was an exciting overview of what is clearly a very exciting <laughs> company. Yes. Well done. <laughs> well, now it is my pleasure to introduce Nancy McLaren, just sitting immediately to my left and your right. She is the president and CEO of the Organization for International Investment. She really looks out for the subsidiaries of a whole host of global companies that have already invested here. So no doubt she would keep her eye on a series of policy initiatives that are being discussed now or perhaps are still on the drawing boards in the current administration. She writes regularly. She's often quoted. You will find her writing or her to or comments in everything from the, uh, the Washington Post to the Financial Times. She is a uh, really an extraordinary asset for us today to give us a real view of how the global companies are thinking about the U.S., maybe what we can do to invite a few more to come. We already have a commitment from the Smiths to move up to number five. <laughs> so we'll count on you to doing something like that, please. The floor is yours, Nancy. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, it is a pleasure to be here um, with you today, and I, I applaud the organizers for holding today's event. Um, as Jim mentioned, you know, this rise of economic nationalism is definitely uh, a concern. I think we've had this general upward trajectory of those that sort of embrace globalization over the last couple of dec decades, and we've got some stumbling blocks now. Um, and so I, I really applaud the organizers for holding today's event to to try to talk about some of these things. So the Organization for International Investment is an association of nearly 200 companies in the United States, and we're very proud to be the voice for inbound investment. The organization started in 1990, and I actually started it after graduate school. And for those of you who may remember, in the late 80s, there was this rapid uptick in Japanese investment in the United States. And there was the book and the movie, The Rising Sun, and everyone said that we were going to be wearing white uniforms and doing Japanese exercises in the morning <laughs> because Japan was taking over, um, but uh, that didn't end up uh, being the case. But at the time, when we started, there were probably over two dozen pieces of legislation on Capitol Hill that would have in some way sought to restrict the ability for foreign-based companies to invest in the United States. And as Jim mentioned, the need to tease out how U.S. citizens benefit from global connections is more important than ever. When people think about globalization, 
I think the best thing we could say is people believe they can go to Walmart and get something for less expensive. They, they're focused on, you know, they've got their consumer hat on and they're focused on that. But we need them to have their worker hat on. They need to understand it's actually about paychecks, not just being able to go a, and get an inexpensive pair of jeans or television. It's actually about uh, paychecks. Um, so I mentioned our membership is about 200 international companies that are in the United States. About one-tenth of them are Swiss-based companies. Uh, ABB is one of them, but we have Zurich and Nestle and Swiss Re, um, all different industries. Uh, and the organization represents companies from all over the world. Other members include major U.S. employers like Siemens and Bosch from Germany, Toyota and Sony from Japan, Rolls-Royce Engines and Diageo from the U.K., um, and so it's really a very broad cross-section of the U.S. economy. Foreign direct investment in the United States is a strong indicator of how competitive our economy is, right? So when an international company makes a deliberate decision to invest and employ people here, it's a vote of confidence, but yet somehow policymakers see it as a vulnerability. Uh, global investment is directly responsible for nearly seven million U.S. jobs. Seven million U.S. jobs. And it's highly concentrated in the manufacturing sector. So 20% of all U.S. manufacturing jobs are at an international company. That means any resurgence of U.S. manufacturing is going to be there courtesy of the global economy. Companies that are building things in the United States from around the world, not only for U.S. consumption, but worldwide. So American workers at international companies produce close to 25% of U.S. exports. That's a huge amount. Um, we talked about compensation. Compensation levels at Swiss-based companies are fantastic. I want my kids to go work for a Swiss-based company. Um, but overall, at international companies, um, they pay about, the compensation is about 24% higher than the private sector average, about 79,000. Again, I want my children to go work for a, a Swiss-based company. Um, Reuters actually recently did an analysis <laughs> that between 2010 and 2014, of the over 656 hundred-thousand manufacturing jobs created, two-thirds of them came from international companies. That is really cool. That is what Global Connections brings us. It's not just about going to Walmart and getting the inexpensive TV. I mean, that's good too, but that's not the only thing. But when you think about it, you know, all the, the products on your shelves, on your neighbor's employer, your, your employer, and the benefits to our economy matched by deep connections to our communities, like Jim talked about, about ABB, um, it's not so foreign after all. And right now, the word foreign is really toxic in policy circles. I mean, if you look up foreign in the dictionary, it means strange or weird. So we try not to use the F word. Um, but sometimes it's hard to, you know, kind of understand what we mean when we talk about global investment. Are you talking about Boeing or are you talking about Airbus? So uh, uh, the um, semantics do, do, in fact, matter. I've had the pleasure of visiting a number of our companies over the last few months, and they are doing really, really cool things. Uh, and I visited them as part of a campaign that we have launched to get governors to issue what we're referring to as open investment policy statements. And these statements reaffirmed the state's appreciation for international companies in their state and pledges to provide to them a level playing field along, right alongside their domestic uh, competitors. And it really sends a hugely important message right now, especially in these very uncertain times, right, where, you know, America first, economic nationalism, and a lot of other countries around the world are, are going, you know, in this direction too. It's not just the U.S. So these open investment policy statements um, provide certainty to global insurers. So we've had seven governors to date do these statements, Arkansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, New Hampshire, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. So bipartisan, Democratic governors, Republican governors, um, and uh, we're hoping many more um, jump on the bandwagon. So if any of you want to talk to our new governor in Virginia uh, or others in the area, we would appreciate that, although we did have him into our office recently to talk about uh, all the international investment in Virginia. 
But unfortunately, even though we've all talked about how the U.S. is a great place to be, all the efforts of Select USA, um, the U.S. is a top destination, but unfortunately, we've lost ground globally. In 2000, the U.S. attracted about 37 percent of the world's cross-border investment. In 2016, we attracted only 24 percent. So you got to sort of pull back the lens. You know, each year we're increasing, but we're getting less uh, of our share, right? And that's because other countries are really stepping up their efforts <laughs> and really working to bring in cross-border investment. Um, all the benefits we talked about uh, in terms of international companies in the U.S., most of it is through acquisition. So people think, oh, I like foreign direct investment because at this point everyone loves the brand new shiny Toyota facility built from the ground up. But actually cross-border M&A activity generates an enormous amount of benefits. If 85 to 90 percent of all foreign direct investment is through acquisition, that means all the benefits we've talked about about foreign direct investment comes from that M&A activity, but it's seen as a political liability. We conducted a survey recently that provides keen insights from our chief financial officers at our companies. And we found, this was just released uh, last week, that 46 percent of respondents believe the U.S. business climate is getting worse for international companies. And this is up from 2014 when just 17 percent of our CFOs thought the environment in the U.S. was getting worse for their business. And further, despite the fact that some policymakers believe foreign companies have a tax advantage, 83 percent of our CFOs said the U.S. tax code in its current form is actually a disadvantage for investing here. So international companies are investing in the U.S. despite our tax system, not because of it. And while more CFOs are expected to increase employment um, than respondents in June, the number saying that they're going to de decrease has more than doubled from 7 to 15. So these are just important warning signs for us to, to you know, take, uh, take note of. In addition to promoting and getting people to understand all the fantastic value that uh, international companies bring to the U.S., we're also an advocacy group. So scarlet letter L for lobbying. Um, and we work at the state level, at the federal level, and in the courts on issues that disproportionately impact international companies. And it's in the tax space. It's in the trade space. It's in the M&A space. It's in the government contracting space. All of these areas have, have um, policies within them that give domestic firms a leg up. I'll give you an example. When Cash for Clunkers was originally um, put forward at the beginning of the Great Recession, do we remember the Cash for Clunkers program, right, where you got to trade in your car, it was a clunker, and then you got a more energy efficient car and you got some money for that. So it was originally written that said, in order to qualify, you had to have a vehicle that was made in the United States at a company that had been here at least 40 years. <laughs> so the longest uh, global automaker who makes in the United States had been here, how many years you think? 39 years. <laughs> so we were able to work with uh, a variety of other allies. We were able to get that change. But that just shows you an example. You know, some of this stuff is pretty insid you know, insidious. It's hard to sort of ferret it out. Um, but these are really important initiatives that if we don't catch them, the U.S. will lose even further ground uh, in terms of uh, bringing in international companies. So with that, I will just stop. <laughs> um, happy to answer any questions about, so tax reform uh, is very live at the moment. Uh, the House just, uh, the Ways and Means Committee just released its final bill. Lots of provisions in there that have got our member companies quite concerned. The Senate Finance Committee is supposed to introduce something a little later today. Uh, I won't get into all the tax, tax technical details, but happy to answer any questions as we get into the panel. So thanks again for having me. Thank you very much, Anne. That was terrific. Yeah. Well, I'd like to give the panelists a chance just to talk among themselves for a minute. Any comments they wanted to make on each other's presentations, uh, any questions that you had for each other? Then I have a couple questions myself that I will pose for our, uh, 
our panelists, and then we'll open the floor to, pa to uh, questions from the audience. Mr. Ambassador, do you have any comments about what you heard? No, I made most of what I heard. Uh, I, 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 did, I did agree. Of course, I would have a lot of questions re with regard to the tax code. This is mm -hmm. uh, uh, something uh, that is uh, probably a concern. We are also looking at it as, as observers uh, from abroad, but it's perhaps too early to, to, to go in. It's, it's probably also a topic when you start you will never find a way out. <laughs> 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 well, well, that was my, to be my first question, so we'll s maybe I'll reconsider that. <laughs> Jim, any thoughts? Yeah, well, I hinted at it, and it was hinted at by a few, including um, Anne, is the importance of the workforce. Um, so hopefully we can get into a discussion about um, the quality of the American workforce, but also how the workforce needs to change to, to meet the the te te technologies being used uh, in manufacturing going forward. Yes, I noticed you made <coughs> STEM education was one of your primary areas of, of donations and that you have an apprenticeship program and so forth. So it sounds like you're a leader in doing some things on that space. We'll return to that. And uh, <laughs> Nancy, um, the what only... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. That's Anne. That's, That's Anne. Nancy. So w I'd actually just remarked, I, I just love Jim's comment about needing to talk to employees more and others about connecting the dots between you being a Swiss company. Because right now, Chinese investment is the tip of the sword when people think of policies impacting foreign companies in the United States. Mm -hmm. And when we started the organization, it was Japanese companies. And when the Iraq war started, it was French companies and the Congress nick or changed the name of French fries to Freedom Fries. We all remember that really important Very, moment yes. in congressional history. Um, and so it's so important for people to connect the dots, even though you want to be a local company, you are a U.S. company, you know, in every way that matters, mm -hmm. um, but getting them connected because if the employees, if the very people who get a paycheck from our companies don't get it, then certainly the person working at Starbucks down the street that benefits from your, your facility being there or, or their grandmother or whatever, they're never going to get it. So I love the idea of, you know, having employees sort of be ambassadors in this front, you know, as they're talking to others at the, you know, bar down the street or whatever it is. So, you know, lo love that. Is that something that you guys, I mean, how, how much sensitivity is there within the company about talking to your U.S. employees about that? Um, well, I think the approach has probably gone back and forth over the decades um, based on sort of the, the environment that we find ourselves in. Um, but we, we absolutely are always upfront about our Swiss nature. Um, and in fact, people love the Swiss. Um, <laughs> the, 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 right? when, you, when you're talking about public, op public opinion polls, uh, they think wonderful things. They think the Swiss are nice. They think the Swiss are innovative. Um, and these are all good things that we're happy to talk right. about. Um, but when it comes down to it, sometimes we've acquired um, companies that have a, a deeper American heritage. Um, and sometimes we still sell products under those brand names. So we're, we're sometimes failing to say, we're ABB and we're Swiss. Um, and so it creates, yeah. it creates some it's difficulty. Hard. It's yeah. a hard, yeah, it's hard. Also, I, I think one of the, of the problems is that a lot of people look at those issues as it was a zero-sum game. You see, also either you produce something in your country or it's produced abroad, also with, with imports and exports. But of course, this is not the case. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, for instance, with investment done in the United States, that it broadens opportunity, it broadens the market, and you end up in a win-win situation. I'm convinced about this. I mentioned to the ambassador that, of course, there's a potential rivalry between Hershey on the one hand and Nestle on the other. And he reminded me that, in fact, the Hershey family was from Switzerland. So <laughs> they just got here a little sooner than ABB. <laughs> well, let me just try a couple of the questions. The taxes have come up. And the idea here is to reduce the corporate tax to 20% from the statutory 35%. Is that important? People say, on the other hand, that the effective tax rate paid by many companies is considerably lower than the 
they're not sure if taxes are important to save labor force or a number of other considerations. How useful would that be in terms of stimulating foreign direct investment in the United States? I think I'll take that one. Um, incredibly important. Um, we would be, we would really welcome um, comprehensive tax reform, including uh, a reduction in the corporate tax rate. We're not getting so much true reform um, in, in what's being discussed in Congress. Um, I think the name of the bill is Tax Cuts and Jobs Bill. Um, so it's really about tax cuts. Um, but there are some concerning provisions in there. I mean, it's not just about the corporate rate. It's about many complicated ways that different types of investments are treated. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of discussion about the interest expense, uh, expensing of, of net interest. And, um, and that's important for companies who are uh, using borrowed money to make important acquisitions uh, in the future of their company. Would you be happy if they made dividends deductible so that they would be a level playing field between debt and equity? I will defer those questions to our tax experts who are, have spent, what, since Thursday until today, pouring through all the details of the bill as it changes. Um, but one comment I will make um, is that as much as anything, certainty is important. Um, and we're creating new uncertainties um, as we're moving ahead with this bill, um, especially as some things will be temporary. That's not certainty. Mm -hmm. When we make investments here, we don't make investments here for five years. Um, you know, we're going to put uh, employees on the ground and, and modernize our facilities. Um, we're here for the long term, and temporary tax provisions just don't allow us to do the, the type of planning we would like to do. Before we leave taxes, there's one other fundamental change that's being talked about is shifting the U.S. from a global tax posture to a territorial one, which is common in most countries. Would that make it more attractive to invest here, or would that not particularly affect foreign investment choices? Yeah, from, from, from what everyone in my company tells me, yes, that would be incredibly important, um, and it would put us on par with how we're treated in other countries. Mm -hmm. So if I could jump in a little bit on the tax <laughs> stuff. Um, so um, uh, when the House first introduced its bill, and it talked about, you know, it was moving to a 20% rate. So we have a company that um, actually pays the current 35% rate at the federal level, despite all the folks thinking that big multinational companies pay, you know, much less. There are a lot of uh, international companies, multinational companies, that do pay the 35% rate. The way that the bill was first initiated, um, that company would go to a 41% tax rate. So there's so many different ways that things can be written. You can't just look at that statutory rate, mm -hmm. right? And if tax reform is going to help, uh, is going to meet the president and the Congress's growth targets, which are aggressive, they're going to need the full potential of companies like ABB um, and Siemens and, and Toyota um, in order to meet those goals. And the way that the, the House first uh, introduced legislation it wasn't about tax avoidance as much as expanding the tax base. And it, it reached into global supply chains and sort of brought profit in that was going to be taxed by other countries into the United States. And so it would have violated our tax treaties and, and other things. So there's so much complication in tax. This was the excise tax that they were This was the, the excise <coughs> tax, mm -hmm. right. So they have sent out their mark today, the House has, and they've actually changed that pr pr uh, provision because they heard enough from multinational companies that it was uh, very problematic, as well as from our embassy community. Mm -hmm. um, but as Jim mentioned, um, the, the interest deductibility uh, issue is a really important one as well, and especially for subsidiaries of companies that are headquartered overseas, being able to borrow money from their parent company and others is really important to finance operations here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we would suggest, as some have claimed that we have a bias in our system against equity, uh, or they've said it's a fav uh, favorable towards debt, we would say, well, then re reduce the, um, you know, disadvantage of equity rather than increase the cost of capital mm -hmm. and change the way we're, we're able to uh, deduct uh, net interest expense. Well, this is just an example of what we're going to be doing for the next month. <laughs> well, these two different tax bills are talked about and changed and modified and there's a, there is virtually nothing in the tax code that doesn't have a champion. And so they'll all be looking very carefully at what the changes 
that are being made, that it will be a challenge for the people actually working on these tax bills. They're not going to get a lot of sleep over the next month. Well, let me, before we leave taxes completely, just wanted to really look at the broader question of what does attract a foreign direct investor here? Is it the general business climate? Is it a posture toward regulation? Is it the R&D strength where a company like ABB, and I suspect many of your members think, well, this is an advantage to be on the ground where a lot of the innovative thinking is, is going forward. You mentioned the labor force. Is that critical? Or the local quality of education? What are the items that are most important? See, talk the top three items that a foreign company would look at. I'm sorry, I'm using the effort. An international company <laughs> would look at in terms of uh, choosing to invest in the United States? Um, I could give a presentation that talked about the top three <laughs> reasons, in fact. Um, yeah, it, our market is here, our customers are here. We want to be close. Um, as, as I said, we, we invest around the world, um, and we have the, the largest mar single market is here in the United States. So we need to be similarly large and present and connected with our customers. Um, workforce is essential. Um, U.S. has a great workforce. Many other countries do as well. Um, this, tech, this technology uh, environment that we're in, where the U.S. is really leading on next generation technologies, if you want to be a global company um, and, and truly grow, you need to be here in the U.S. Um, if you have a connection to technology, and pretty much every industry does, um, it is really, it's permeated into everything. Um, you need to be here connected with those technology partners um, and, uh, you know, innovating alongside with them or else you'll be left behind. Um, one thing I will say, and, and Nancy hinted at it, uh, and commented on it, stability and certainty in, in, in favorable government policy towards, towards business uh, investment, very important. Um, and again, stability over a long period of time uh, is critical. So that's, we, we find that in the U.S., um, and we hope, uh, you know, we continue to find that here. Nancy, what would you say? I, I mean, I think that uh, Jim hit on it. The only thing I would add is uh, the U.S. entrepreneurial spirit. Right? In some countries, if you fail, you're a failure. In the U.S., you know, our motto is try, try again. And I, I hear that from, from many companies um, that are headquartered outside the United States and bringing especially R&D here. You know, Novartis moved its worldwide R&D headquarters from Basel, Switzerland, to Cambridge, Massachusetts, to be sort of in that eco center there. And, you know, we have a, a variety of our companies that have actually come here because the ability to, you know, continue to innovate and, and that entrepreneurial spirit I've heard many, many times. Mr. Ambassador, I know you've no doubt hear from a lot of Swiss companies that are looking at investing around the world. But what do you hear from them about, well, on the balance, we're really going to go to the U.S. because of ABC? Yeah, I, I, th I think it depends very much on the company. I would not give a template answer uh, mm -hmm. on that. What we very often hear is uh, the access to technology companies who want, for instance, digitalize their production process, find a good environment here, and also a space where they can gain a lot of experience that, it's that are also interesting in other markets. Switzerland is a, is a country very much dependent on, uh, let's say, international uh, uh, trade uh, relations, 50% of our GDP is earned abroad. And so having the opportunity to go to the United States, find the right partnerships, doing innovation is also a step to go elsewhere. And then I would very much uh, echo what uh, you were saying with, I mean, the Swiss, the strengths of the Swiss, of our mentality is the precision to some extent. You see these watchmakers and uh, <laughs> this, this uh, uh, type of trades. And in a certain way, what you find in the United States is complementary. Uh, embarking for new frontiers, uh, running risks, making experience that you can use to build up new business models. And I think this is probably one of the reasons why there is so much of an attraction for Swiss companies to come to the United States and, 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 to, to, and to work here. Uh, this I find, uh, this, this, this element I find, as well as in, in big companies, 
as in, in very small ones. So there are a lot of small uh, companies starting their business here in the United States. Well, I hear all three of you turning to the question of research and development and innovative culture. Does this suggest that one of the first places that Select USA should go to is OMB and say, for heaven's sakes, keep investing in research and development? Because in the end, that's going to be a magnet that attracts the best of the world companies to the United States. Nancy, what do you think? I, I will leave it open as to whether it should be government funded or the private sector. I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it open to that. But certainly, um, you know, having uh, companies like ABB that is doing apprenticeship programs and partnering with community college and other things like that, I think help bring the private sector together with, um, with the government uh, in, a, in a really positive and productive way. And the more that we can get the private sector talking to a variety of different, um, you know, educational, uh, you know, venues, whether it be elementary school or um, college. You know, I have three kids. I have two almost graduated from college and one still in college. And, you know, I would just love for them to actually have some real life experience and know what it is that's going to make them have a great job in the future. And the apprenticeship programs are just such a, a great example. So. Um, so, but absolutely, R and D is, is critical, and not only, you know, literally, but also, you know, new ways in which that we we train potential workers, coming up with innovative ways to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I mentioned, we have one of our corporate research centers uh, in the U.S. It's in Raleigh, in the in uh, NC State's campus. Um, so critically important, and we have a lot of great universities here. We partner with uh, dozens of them. Um, the federal government is involved occasionally, and the, the federal government is important uh, in terms of. Uh, bringing uh, a collaborative uh, approach towards research, um, but certainly there's there's huge private investment in research in partnership with universities in partnership um, with other companies, our technology partners, as I mentioned earlier, uh, large ones and small ones. Um, so yeah, research and development is, is key, um, and of course there's there's research at the corporate level, sort of next generation stuff, um, but then we localize our research uh, in our factories where we're really trying to develop the next product, um, you know, sort of the next innovation in a product, which is not, not entirely revolutionary like you might do um, at a corporate research center, but, but we localize it um, in, in Fort Smith, Arkansas with regard to our electric motors, for instance, um, where we're trying to create the next product maybe two to three years out. Let's turn to your labor uh, question. If you look at the program on international student assessment, the U.S. among OECD countries is about average. When you add some of the top non-OECD countries in, the U.S. slips below average. The U.S. used to lead the world in the number of the percentage of its population with a four-year college degree or more. Now we've done a little better than we did in the past, but we've slipped to number 12 on that list. What should we be doing in terms of labor force, the STEM education? Nancy put her appropriate uh, uh, emphasis on apprenticeships. Uh, what do you, Mr. Ambassador, do you have any thoughts about the, the Swiss, I know, have an excellent system? Uh, what should we be doing here to make sure we are preparing our young people and our established people for this wave of innovation that's coming? Well, it's difficult for me to make, uh, let's say, a, a comment, and I'm not, uh, I'm not here to, to lecture what should be done. Well, we can use some lecturing in, here, uh, I think, <laughs> actually. <laughs> in, 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 in the United States. What, 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 what you can see in the United States is really the top research institutions, the top universities. But I think uh, it's, uh, it, it's really a kind of a polarization. If you go at, let's say, the bottom end of the education, it's probably much less uh, a less of a quality education than you would find in Switzerland. Apprenticeship is, uh, is a good element. In Switzerland, about 70% of the people start their professional career with an apprenticeship. Uh, there is afterwards an open system uh, it, skill of people is developed and somebody that ha who has started with, as an apprentice, for instance in banking, can become the CEO of UBS as it is the case with Sergio M. Motti uh, today. And I think 
uh, there we have uh, an advantage in our education system. This is uh, reasonable for a country like Switzerland that has basically no other resources than brain power. So we cannot afford in our economy to uh, leave people behind or to not train people or to work with other things than with people uh, with people's skills. Uh, we have seen a lot of interest in the US in the Swiss apprentice uh, system. So, so recently there were discussions we had with uh, the Secretary of Labor, Education and, and Commerce and with uh, Ivanka Trump. Uh, she has a mandate uh, uh, from the president and this is an area I very often hear also from Swiss companies that they found it difficult to find uh, the right skill set and apparently uh, six to eight million uh, jobs uh, cannot be filled because there is a lack of the, of the trained labor force. And I think this is something I would, uh, if I was uh, let's say responsible here in the United States, put a lot of emphasis, it's a kind of a low hanging fruit uh, to create jobs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jim? You know, certainly a, a comprehensive um, encouragement in education from when children are very young until when they enter the workforce is important. Um, we've made a lot of investments at uh, kindergarten level, trying to get excitement um, in engineering uh, and math and in the STEM fields. Those are the types of people we're going to need. Um, you had made the comment, Ken, about number of four-year uh, college graduates falling down relative to our, our global peers, uh, which is, you know, it's not a great indication. Um, but I guess the other side of the coin is, um, and I just came from a lunch um, talking about uh, this, we do need to sh con uh, shift the way we think about what education is needed uh, for, for next generation jobs. Is it, you know, we've spent, I think, 40, 50 years saying really the, the path to success in America is a four-year college degree. Um, I think that's changing. I think people look back and say, well, maybe that's not actually the, 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 the tools that, that are needed for all jobs is a four-year college degree. So uh, we're very excited about um, partnering with high schools and getting and the technical skills um, into the students' hands. Those are the types of people we need at our factories. Um, across the country, so it's very important to do that. Um, one other comment is, as, as workers are entering the workforce, um, our CEO, um, Ulrich Spieshofer, has said this, um, actually, I think at the Select USA uh, Summit a couple of years ago, uh, but he said his, his son asked him, what should I do? What should I be when I grow up? I, mean, I think it's high school. What should I, what should I do? He, sh he said, do whatever you want, do what you love, um, but do something and just be prepared to switch because you will be switching careers however many times uh, in your lifetime. So we, I guess he's, he's talking about this switch between an intergenerational change in, in the types of jobs that somebody does to a, a, an intragenerational. So where it used to be a, uh, was a, in the old days, a father to son saying, you know, son, don't do what I did. This, that, you know, my industry's going away. Now maybe a mother to a daughter is saying, um, as, as our, our CEO said, Enter, uh, enter the workforce in something you love, but be prepared to learn on the job and change skills um, and because it, things are just happening so much faster out there in the workforce. I always thought that one of President Clinton's best policies was when he said, be prepared to have five, six, seven jobs in your life. The idea of the 40 years, the gold watch, and maybe for some people, the golf course, uh, that's, that era is, <coughs> is really gone. Yeah. And so you uh, emphasized yeah. apprenticeships too. Yeah, so I would just add that uh, I think it's counterintuitive that companies like ABB are here training U.S. workers, right? That it's counterintuitive because sometimes people conflate foreign investment and, and immigration issues, right? We're just bringing in people from our parent companies, right? But, you know, I see within our membership the emphasis on uh, training the U.S. workforce. And I think that one of the important things is for us to remain very open to how companies that are global um, do things in other countries. That the U.S. doesn't have a sort of license on knowing how the best way to, to train the next generation of workforce. And one of the benefits is that we're importing ideas from other companies that do things differently around the world to the United States. So it, it's actually an added benefit of our global connections. 
right, is that, well, maybe the U.S., the, the four-year college system and how we've done things to date isn't the best answer. But as long as we remain open, we get to pick and choose and think about ideas that are best practices around the world. And I would just offer it up as another way that, you know, the U.S. can, can think about things if we keep our, our borders open to, to global companies coming in. Let me ask one last question, because I know everyone has their questions already in their mind. CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., which looks at foreign investments where it raises a question of national security. Has that been an impediment, say, Nancy, for your members? Um, so uh, the um, Committee on Foreign Investment, uh, which is chaired by the Treasury Department, is an interagency uh, group that reviews foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies that impact national treatment, as you said. National treatment is left undefined deliberately because in 1990, national treatment may be one thing than it does in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, we have been enormously supportive of the CFIUS process because, of course, protecting our national security is in all of our interests. We have tried mostly to focus and ensure that that system remains, uh, you know, unpoliticized and that it's not used as a way to achieve something that couldn't be achieved in the marketplace. And we've seen some domestic competitors use the CFIUS process to scuttle deals by raising concerns. So, you know, it's important to closely monitor um, how that process works. Um, the biggest concern that I hear from my companies about the current system is that it's just taking longer and longer for deals to go through the review process, which is probably due to a number of important factors, but uh, resources uh, at the, the government level is one of them for sure. Um, and time is money. And I know investment bankers that first review domestic to domestic acquisitions because there's more certainty there. Than, than foreign to U.S. acquisitions. Um, yesterday, Senator Cornyn introduced a new piece of legislation to amend the CFIUS process. Mm -hmm. um, and he has really uh, great uh, goals. Uh, he is very focused on national security and how things have changed. But there's also some massive changes the way that the government is going to review these deals that has created a bit of concern within our membership. So we're going to hopefully work with, with the senator on that. It's a time where foreign is really scary, whether it be immigration or foreign influence in the process, or there's also legislation that was been introduced so that would, in, would basically have Jim have to register as a foreign agent with the Justice Department as opposed to just registering with his domestic um, uh, colleagues um, uh, under the Lobbying Disclosure Act. Um, and so there are a lot of geopolitical things that are happening now mm -hmm. that is going to create more uncertainty for global companies. And we need to keep national security first and foremost, but we need to balance all of these different objectives. Jim? Sure. Yeah, I'm not aware. I mean, I've, I'm, not, I'm not part of any of, of the acquisition team. So I'm not aware of, of how CFIUS has impacted uh, ABB over the years. Um, but certainly, changes that might be in the offing sound more concerning than the status quo, that's for sure. Mr. Ambassador, do your companies raise that question with you at all, the, this national security review? No, I'm not aware of this, as it has not been uh, raised with us. Well, thank you all. Now, I'm, let's open it up for your questions here. Uh, if you could just raise your hand, uh, Peter. We have a microphone coming. If, and please introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Okay, Peter Wogert from the... Um, uh, German Institute of uh, Area and uh, World Studies in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, just as a short comment first, uh, obviously it's good to be a small country sometimes. Uh, <laughs> bigger countries do have bigger problems and some companies we had indeed lots of trouble. But uh, what is I think interesting in this context too is the export imports which has been so much stressed by the Trump company and uh, government uh, that uh, particular uh, the EEC countries have been this overhang, which Switzerland has avoided. I saw this, you know, the graph here where your exports and imports of goods and services are nearly equal, which obviously is indeed an advantage. How is it with these most companies here, their exports and imports? Are they also this, you know, pretty much balanced or where do you see problems? 
Nancy or Jim probably would be the. Sure. Um, thanks for the question. So we invest around the world uh, to be close to our customers. So we have a lot of domestic production for domestic and local use. Um, so if you look at, at uh, the U.S., you know, we have very close ties with Mexico and Canada uh, in terms of our trade, uh, both in terms of inputs into what we're making in the U.S., um, as well as export markets. But we, we fairly localize around the world. Um, there is certainly some technology that flows back and forth between um, other places like Europe and the United States. Um, but for the most part, uh, the NAFTA countries um, are, are really critical to us. Um, so in terms of uh, how things are changing in the world of trade, uh, NAFTA revisions um, could be problematic. I would add that, um, you know, I think that it's unfortunate to view relationships between countries just very narrowly looking at the trade in and out of the country, right? We've talked a lot about um, investment here. That's a, that's a key issue, right? And actually, the volume of uh, cross-border investment rivals that of trade. So looking at the relationship between the two countries just based on a um, goods deficit um, can be uh, not helpful. I mean, we look between the U.S. and Korea. I mean, Korea is a much smaller country. How could we expect the Korean uh, citizens will buy as much from the U.S. as we buy from, from Korean companies? But yet, since w uh, the Korean Free Trade Agreement was enacted, Korean investment in the U.S. has risen by 40 percent. And so it doesn't always you know, help us to just look at that very narrow input, uh, uh, you know, um, exports and imports equation. Professor, you had a question? Yeah. Um, Here's the microphone. Oh, thank you very much. My question would be, uh, maybe to Nancy, how much is the U.S. legal system a problem for you, for, for international companies in, to want to invest in the United States, you know, the, the uh, risk that they uh, might uh, have be faced with uh, class actions and huge liabilities, is this an issue? Um, so, you know, I think it's an issue the same for U.S. companies as it is for international companies. The one thing I will say is that we recently um, had uh, some statistics looked at that, that shows that uh, international companies um, pay on average about 22 times higher fines than their U.S. competitors in, uh, in legal um, matters. Um, it, there's a, and it could be for a variety of different reasons. One, do international companies not understand the very long arm of U.S. law? Um, do they settle cases in a way that just they want to settle it so they'll pay more money? Um, or is there a bias in our courts um, against an international company? You know, we see decisions coming out of the, um, the FTC at the moment against Bombardier, Samsung, LG, and uh, some may think, oh, well, we decided against a foreigner. That's best for the U.S. economy. Well, th those three companies directly employ thousands of people across the U.S. The way we think of national champions is not the same today as it was in 1990, right? So why do we care more about the worldwide success, you know, the success of GE in Germany than we do Siemens success in the U.S. Or to your, your mention earlier about Nestle, why do we care more about Hershey's success worldwide than Nestle's success right here in the United States? It's where we're conditioned to thinking that, but the world is changing. There's a lady in the second row. Oh, yes. The uh, microphone is on its way. Thank you. Again, please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Angela Brock, and I am totally from the alternative investment world. So I want to thank you very much. It's been very informative, all the things I've heard today. But no, my number one question is, um, and I guess to you, Ambassador, and then maybe to Nancy, is on par with other countries, is the issue that the United States has this rule of law, does it really impact you know, uh, foreign direct investment from private investors, as opposed to you're talking about multinationals investing but what about the playing field for private investors who want to who are in Europe or throughout the the globe want to invest in the United States what is your experience with that 
in terms of their reasons for wanting to invest here? Also, also what I hear and what also the figures show is that the United States is an interesting place for, uh, for investors in Switzerland. I mean, this is the, the, the result uh, you, can, you can clearly show with the figures. And of course, as it is always the case with statistics, there are very, very different, uh, very, very different individual choices behind. And uh, I'm convinced, looking at the U.S. economy, uh, that this will stay uh, more or less as it is. And what gives me a lot of confidence is uh, that you see that the United States is technologically advanced. All the major uh, innovations, and innovations means to translate something uh, from an invention to a business model, have mainly taken place in the United States. Uh, digit uh, sharing economy, uh, or, 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 or before, uh, let's say, uh, the internet, the development of the internet, and so on. And, and I th I'm, I'm very confident that this will stay that way. And when I speak to investors, uh, I, I I'm very much hear this. With all the, the little things you have here and there, and uh, are making people angry and create uh, perhaps uncertainty. If you are to look at the long trend, I'm sure that the United States is a good place to invest. Mm -hmm. Jim or Nancy, do you have any? It's really outside my area of expertise, so I, I don't work with uh, individual investors. And we're that multinational company. I wish I had that. <laughs> I wish I had to struggle with those kinds of decisions myself. <laughs> so, gentleman, well in the back there. Uh, Herbert Regenbogen. Um, I'm a professor for international relations and international law, but also very much involved in financial history of Switzerland. And one of the primary questions I have in our present state is that w the companies abroad, especially Novartis, the number one and two companies of Europe, especially focus on three pillars. One is environment, climate. Second is globalization. And the third one is technology. The United States is inward bound. How can the stakeholders be promising a future of optimism when the risk assessment of these corporations are quite aware that they need to establish enormous reserves to deal with these elements when the United States, it's abundantly clear, there's too much self-denial, especially on the first pillar of climate. Jim, sure. climate seems to be your, your specialty. To right, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, ABB has a very strong climate statement. Um, it represents the company globally. Um, you know, we, we not only are, are committed to doing our part as a company uh, to contribute to reduced emissions and um, mitigating climate change, but also our technologies are all about efficiency, more productivity for less resources. A tagline um, that our CEO uh, has said is that ABB wants to help run the world without consuming the earth. We have a financial stake in all of these um, mm -hmm. Uh, in, in, in the, the battling of climate change. Uh, we have efficient technology, smart technologies. Uh, so we're all in um, on, on applying technology to help solve this global challenge. Nancy, what do you hear from your members? Yeah, actually, um, it, it's, uh, it's really a positive story. International companies, because of their global heritage and because other countries in which they come from have prioritized environmental uh, efficiency uh, actually more than the U.S. has, they're leaders in the United States. I had mentioned earlier that, you know, I've been to a few of our facilities over the last just couple of months. I was at a L'Oreal facility in Arkansas that is now the largest cosmetic manufacturer, manufacturing facility in the world. A French-based company having the largest cosmetic manufacturing facility in the world, not just at L'Oreal, but in the world in Arkansas, 
they have just um, uh, put in this like whole solar field they that runs about 20 to 30 percent of the company's energy. They have zero waste from that facility, making mascara and all sorts of things. It was so impressive. My uh, my 21 year old daughter is a global conservation major at George Mason, and she's taking a class. And you know it's a very anti corporate class, and they're all like, "Oh, corporations stink." And um, she comes, you know, she talks to me about it, and I'm like, "Let me tell you, this cool stuff that's going on at some of our companies." I went to visit a BASF facility, um, that uh, largest chemical company in the world, German company. Um, I'm not even gonna remember what state I was in, um, but uh, just of all the different travel I've done, but they have packaging now that uh, it's sort of a plasticky type packaging but that is completely completely decomposes in 90 days in 90 days that is gone and they they sponsor different sort of um, events at sporting um, places around you know different stadiums where they have a zero waste day and so these global companies are actually leading the way because of their global heritage on many of these issues regarding corporate social responsibility. Um, so, and I, it makes me just even that much more proud to, to work for this organization. Mr. Ambassador, I always think of the, the beautiful, pristine hills in Switzerland. Um, do you see the climate change being a priority there as well? So f now we're expecting from uh, economic uh, ties with the United States, of course, it's uh, an important issue. Don't forget that uh, Switzerland is more or less the source of all the rivers in Europe with the huge glaciers in the mountains. And we have seen uh, uh, the last, uh, in the last year that they are reducing, as in Himalaya, also in the Alps. Mm -hmm. And this is a reason of concern for the watersheds, not only in Switzerland, but also in the surrounding uh, countries. This is the most obvious thing we can see in Switzerland. Therefore, there is a commitment of the Swiss government and shared by the population in favor of being very active uh, in, in, fighting, uh, in, in fighting climate change. And we uh, know that uh, you can achieve those objectives only with a strong commitment and cooperation with the private sector. It's not an issue you can solve by regulations. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Please, uh, we have a question here in the second row. And please introduce yourself, Meg. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm Meg Lunsager, a public policy fellow here at the Wilson Center, but previously I was at the IMF and long ago at the U.S. Treasury handling trade and investment matters, like the multilateral agreement on investment that um, disappeared from sight many years ago. But my question really comes back to, Kent, what you were bringing up earlier, like for instance on CFIUS and the Corn and Bill, uh, Nancy, that you were discussing. <coughs> How much of this do you think is concern about China? You know, I was just in China a couple, uh, last week, and they were complaining about the U.S. investment environment being much harder and saying they want to bring a lot of the kinds of things your companies are bringing to the United States. But there seems to be much more suspicion about Chinese companies, whether it's protecting data or protecting technology, respecting, you know, patents and that sort of thing in the United States, whereas your companies all seem to have pretty good reputations. And Nancy, I don't know what your membership is, if you have Chinese companies, Chinese subsidiaries among your membership. But I, I've just been a little surprised how we haven't really gotten into that most sensitive area of um, what seems to be contributing to this negative environment in the United States. So I'd just be interested in all of you, all, all three of you, four of you, Kent, you too, what your take is on concerns about you know, Chinese competition, Chinese investment, China adhering to standards. Uh, Chinese transparency in terms of state-owned enterprises that may be behind a lot of this investment. Um, just how do you counter that? How does, and any suggestions you have for how does the U.S. accept and invite the kind of investment that's good for the U.S. economy, what you've been describing, yet still protect it, <coughs> protect itself against either unfair competition or concerns about national security? Thank you. 
Nancy, this, <laughs> you were specifically mentioned. Yes. I'll give that to you. For yeah, absolutely. Happy to take the question. Uh, it's a really, really good question. So uh, we have about a handful of Chinese companies uh, in our memberships of, of over two, you know, almost 200 companies. We've got a handful of Chinese-based firms. Um, I, I think some of the issues uh, of concern are real, right, and our security matters and competition policy, right? You've got state-owned entities. How can a private company compete fairly against a company that can print its own money, right? But the, these are competition issues. Um, and, you know, I remember, again, in 1990 when the organization started, there was a concern of Japanese investment, that they had a very strong industrial policy and that their market was relatively close to U.S. companies investing there, and so we should stop them from investing here. So we have a, we have a complicated um, policies that we need to figure out how to walk uh, and chew gum at the same time. And we were able to do that with Japan. We didn't build up um, uh, barriers for their investment here. And Japanese investment and employment at Japanese-based companies in the U.S. has gone very, very well. And China is not Japan. So there are additional concerns with that. So that makes it that much harder. Um, but, you know, some of, the, some of the changes that Senator Cornyn, I think, is, is trying to get us to talk about could, could be done um, actually through, through different ways. That, that the, the ultimate ownership of a company isn't where the trigger point is. So I remember when a Chinese uh, insurance company bought the Waldorf Astoria. And we have a lot of our high-ranking diplomats and presidents stay at the Waldorf when they go to New York. And it was like, well, this is a national security concern. We, you know, but because we have, you know, <coughs> officials going to the Waldorf. Well, I'm hoping there's a security sweep there regardless of who owns that company not just if it's a Chinese-based company, right? And, and when I think about the concern about our supply chains and, and what might be happening in China, well, the iPhones are made right in China. Why aren't we concerned about that supply chain? Is it only because when it's a, you know, the, the ultimate ownership of the company it ma that matters? Or it's gotta, it's gotta be different than that. Can we get to some of these concerns through changes in our export control laws? Can we get through change to some of this by changes to our trade policy, but not based on the ultimate owner of the company? Because then we're in a false sense of security for, for, for you know, those with U.S. companies. You know, sometimes the call comes from inside the house. And so we shouldn't just assume, because it's a, a, a company that's headquartered outside the United States, that they're more problematic than U.S. companies. My son, I just keep bringing my kids into this, I'm sorry. My son just got commissioned in the Air Force and they had to do a, co a security check. And she came to, this officer came to my house on Monday and her first question to me is, has your son ever worked for a foreign owned company? And I was like, do you know who you're asking? <laughs> and I was like, oh, this whole thing, well, why is that relevant? Which she, and she was just like, oh my gosh, stop. But, but it was like, cause that's what we think. We think, well, a foreign-owned company could do us more harm than a U.S.-owned company. And that's just a really old-fashioned way of thinking it. We've got to get more sophisticated than that. I didn't answer your question because it's not quite an answer, but I just raised other things that make it more complicated. Jim, I suspect ABB has some operations in China, an enormous market, enormous opportunity. Does that, uh, their approach to business uh, weigh on your uh, strategies at all? To be honest, I would be I would be unqualified to answer that question. Absolutely, we have a big presence in China. It's one of our largest, um, but again, it's back to that market, um, and we localize there. Um, but we do have international supply chains, and and uh, certainly some we have some components that come over to the U.S. that go into products that we make in um, in in American states, and so these are these are certainly real concerns. Um, but I'll. I'll I'll leave Nancy's comments. I thought they were excellent. <laughs> Can I add one more thing on that? Of course. Um, that, that companies need to understand it's not just Chinese-based companies that, that need to worry about that in the United States because ABB's investments here are going to be looked at in a particular way because you have exposure in China. So we've seen deals that are scuttled German company because of their exposure in China, not because they were a Chinese-owned company. So all this stuff is conflating. Mr. Ambassador, I know in Germany there was a concern about the Chinese acquisition of KUKA and a, a robotics firm that was part of their automotive cluster, and they felt they couldn't have a reciprocal relationship with China. They couldn't buy a similar 
company in China, and eventually they themselves turned to a CFIUS-like process that they wanted to check acquisitions if it affected their national security. Is there a similar kind of concern in Switzerland, and is it to some extent focused on China? As I'm not in a, in a position to on, give an answer uh, mm -hmm. to you to uh, this very specific question, but uh, going back to your questions, uh, to your question, and let's say the concerns that there is, if I understood you correctly, some form of unfair competition in between, let's say, the United States and China and other countries. Uh, I have a, um, my answer to those issues is, uh, and I know it's, uh, it sounds perhaps a little bit outdated, uh, is that we should rely on global rules as they have uh, been defined in the World Trade Organization that include even dispute settlement mechanisms, and this is the way how I think we should proceed. I don't think it's the right thing to do to enter in kind of trade wars in, 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 in measures against another uh, country, or also makes little sense to believe that you can break down all the trade relations in bilateral relations and seek for all of those bilateral relations and equilibrium. So what I think what is desperately needed now is to uh, reinforce the multilateral uh, trade mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Meg, you also asked me to comment, so I'll take the liberty of doing that. I just last week finished reading the, three, the English translation of Xi Jinping's three and a half hour address to the 19th Com uh, Congress of the Communist Party. It is a very impressive document. It's full of aspirations full of ambitions for the future, a sense that China is not only now a, a player on the world stage, but it offers the world a different system, a different way of approaching development, it invites developing countries to say, look what we've done, this enormous growth over a short period of time. And they generally are not viewed as spreading what one thinks of as the traditional Western values of a democracy, human rights, and so forth. So there's that question that hovers in the background. The other question I hear people asking me is on terms of the rules that Switzerland and Europe and the U.S. and many other countries have helped build over the last 70 years, is we now face what some people see as a system challenge. So they ask me, say, okay, we're going to play a game of, of European football, we put our best striker and top goalie out there. We've got our best 11 on the field, and the opposing team comes out with 18 players. So what do we do about a system challenge? And I think these two questions hover in the background in a way that, to some extent, the system challenge was there with Japan, and now we face it with regard to what some people regard as a mix of the East Asian miracle and state capitalism and so forth. So I think these fundamental questions are things that are going to influence legislation and thinking and, uh, and our continued effort to follow the ambassador's advice, which is to continue to build the, uh, the rules-based system that has worked so well for so many. Well, we have time for maybe one more question, then I'm going to give the panel the last chance to get the last word. Do we have another question? Yes, well, please. Uh, Okay. We'll have two last questions. Yeah, I, I had a okay. question to one of the people. Hey, um, I work for Center for International Environmental Law. We have offices in D.C. and also in Geneva. And um, nice panel, thank you. So. What we are doing now, part of our work is to bring financial mechanism into the discussion of climate change. And so we really want to bring the pri uh, private sector like closer to the discussion and to say like, hey, fighting against climate change is not only about your brand building, it's also about to avoid some um, real financial and maybe litigation risks. So my question to um, you is, like, 
from your perspectives, like how I mean, dealing with climate change would impact maybe your organization or like your agenda in the respect of um, business or investment or um, international relationships. Thank you. Let's add your last question and then we'll go to the panel. Thank you. Actually, it's not too far off of hers, but it's not so specific to climate change. And it has to do with the payment systems, the new payment systems that are coming out, the ability to, what you're addressing, manage the channel supply chains and the security of supply chains and how, like the new blockchains and the new payment systems that bypass mm -hmm. these major global financing institutions that everyone uses as control mechanisms that also goes kind of to her question. How do you see that impacting the mm -hmm. foreign direct investment, mm -hmm. primarily to you, Nancy, I guess, from, uh, from all of the types of global financial uh, direct investment or foreign direct investment? Do you want to answer the well, first well, one? I'll answer the first one. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Th so the connection, the climate change connection to, uh, you know, an, an organization's financial well-being is uh, it's, it's, it's paramount. And the way we see it is that our customers are going to get ongoing benefit from investment in technologies that have the effect of reducing their emissions and um, resource uh, consumption. But in the near term, they're reducing their costs, they're becoming more productive, um, and they're improving their profi pro profitability. I mean, there is payback on, on technologies from, you know, high voltage direct current transmission to more efficient transformers to uh, smarter manufacturing operations. So it's, it's a two for one. Uh, one. One benefit comes in the, in the near term, and the other is this longer term um, contribution to mitigating climate change. Nancy? Yeah, so just to pick up a little bit uh, on what Jim said, I mean, I, I do think that companies see it as uh, positive on their bottom line. They, they already see it. It's not just reputational. You know, sitting next to, at a dinner, um, a global CEO of a large energy company, and he said, didn't matter that the U.S. backed out of the Paris Agreement because they were going to move forward with the rest of the world in doing things they knew. I mean, because it's the next, uh, you know, step in technology. It's the next. The rest of the world is moving in this direction, and in order to be competitive, you've got to you've got to keep up with. I mean, consumer demand on your, your footprint, uh, your carbon footprint, and other things is um, is driving companies in this direction, and they know in order to be successful. Um, you know, the next generation of technology is becoming more and more energy efficient and, you know, pushing us in that direction. So I know that, that most, if not all, of my companies see um, being kind of good corporate citizens uh, in the environmental space is very critical to their bottom line. And uh, just to pick up on your question, I, I think that any sort of technology um, that reduces costs, which the, one of the things that, that you were talking about definitely does, um, and the U.S. Uh, tends to be sort of ahead of the game on some of those things, can make investing here, uh, you know, more um, attractive. Um, and I know that a lot of our companies, you know, the U.S. subsidiaries, drive that technology to their parent company and to affiliates around the world. So being in the U.S. where you might, um, you know, have access to some quicker technologies and other things that drive down costs, um, can be another benefit of being here that you then export out to your affiliates around the world. I noticed Jim in the list of technologies that ABB was looking at, blockchain was on that list. So suggests that maybe we're moving beyond cryptocurrencies with regard to that, that technology. Did you have a, any response to the two questions? No. Well, I want to give the panel a last chance, last word. Mr. Ambassador, let's stop with you if you have a last word about the whole day, suffering day that we've put all of you through. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I wasn't suffering. <laughs> I wasn't suffering a lot. Um, and I will not come up, let's say, with, with a conclusion repeating what I have said before. But there was an interesting issue in your remark I want to, 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 to pick up. I mean, in a certain way, you have a lot of confidence that 
the markets to some extent will guide us to the right direction and that it is not as important when government policies uh, are not ideal. I don't agree, uh, I, I don't agree with that. I think one of the major challenges we have is uh, a, lack, a lack of governance. And I pointed to this, uh, pointing out to the multilateral trade system. Uh, I think this is also the case uh, uh, with climate change, but it is also the case in very different other issues, how humanitarian law is respected in the battlefields and so on. And uh, therefore, I think it's one of the great challenges of our generation to look at the broad governance and at international rules. And this brings us very much back to the thinking of President Wilson. Mm, so thank you. my final Very word. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Jim, last um, thought? Sure. Uh, back to the discussion about, um, well, this is Swiss Day, after all. So we're talking about uh, trade relations between uh, these two countries. And, and we as an industry need to do a much better job of, of showcasing the value of foreign direct investment, partnering with other nations. You know, you look at the past hundred years where uh, multinationalism and international trade has, has blossomed, so has the standard of living um, around the world, uh, including in the United States. So we've seen uh, a lot of value from, from our relationship with Switzerland uh, and, and other countries around the world, and um, we really need to continue it, and, and ABB is glad to be part of that. Nancy, you get the ultimate last <laughs> word. <laughs> I, I actually can't improve on anything that, that both of these uh, distinguished gentlemen just say. So i just really pleased to be here and thrilled that we're having a conversation of cross-border investment, not just the trade of goods and services, um, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be part of it. Let me make one last announcement that we've been trying to give you a good deal of food for thought. But now we're going to invite you for some real food down at the Great Hall on the first floor, a uh, reception for, for all of you. Mm -hmm. And now let me ask you to give a round of applause for a really outstanding <laughs> panel.